one. You will hear a man making an application and being shown around a local facility. Before you listen again, you have 30 seconds to read questions 1 to 4. Good afternoon. I'd like to join the library. Take a seat. I'm Tanya Porter, a librarian here. Nice to meet you, Tanya. I'm Paolo de Melo. The application process is quite short and involves filling in a form and a tour of the library. In order to become a member, Paolo, I'll need some photo ID. Actually, I've brought my passport. Lovely. You'll also need to prove that you live or work nearby. My office is just around the corner in Belmore Road. Here's my business card. Will that be enough proof? Yes, I think so. Thanks. So, you're an accountant. That's right. I'll write accountant on the application form. What's your residential address, Paolo? My wife and I live at number 19, Wood Street. And your email address? It's paolo2020 at hotmail.com. P-A-U-L-O-2020? Yes. If you don't mind, I'll just scan your passport. I see you're from Brazil. We've got a section for languages other than English, but I'm afraid we don't have many Portuguese items. I'd be grateful if you could recommend any must-see movies. I'd be delighted. By the way, does my wife need to join as well? Or can she use my card? She's welcome to use yours. But if she brings anything back late, you'll have to pay the fine. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have 30 seconds to read questions 5 to 10. Let's go outside now, Paolo, to see the returns shoot. You can put your returns in it at any time. In fact, I'm told this complex is open 24 hours and there's always a security guard on duty. Next to the shoot is the notice board, where we advertise library events and community events. My wife might like to join a book club. Why not? Our book clubs have proven very popular. We've got three different ones running at present. The majority of our events are free, but I would recommend booking since we only seat 20 people in the events room. Back inside, here's my desk, and opposite, on the right, an area for newspapers and magazines. That's always a popular spot. Behind the papers is the foreign language section I was referring to before. Here's the main part of the library with our fiction collection. It's one of the biggest in the country. Non-fiction, however, is not so large. What can I see through that glass wall? Our teens room for teenagers, the events room for clubs and talks, and a small storeroom on the right. When we had all that rain over the new year, the teens' room was flooded. So while it's being renovated, we're using the events room instead. I'm impressed. 
Do you also have a computer room? There's no dedicated one. Our six computers are behind my desk. You'll find the library catalogue is all online, and we subscribe to a number of databases that are excellent for research. By the way, how many items can I borrow at a time? Up to ten for one month. You can renew everything except for DVDs for a fortnight. There's no renewal allowed on DVDs, and you can renew by phone, by text message, or online. Thanks a lot, Tanya. I imagine I'll drop into the library on the way back from work in the evenings. I see you're open quite late. Yes, 6 p.m. Monday, Tuesday, and Friday, and 9 p.m. Wednesday and Thursday. But your hours are limited at weekends. I'm afraid that's true. Just Saturday mornings. We're still seeking permission from the council to open on Sundays, and we'll probably get that before the end of the year. Any more questions, Paolo? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. Sydney Harbour Bridge Climb. You will hear a man preparing people to climb the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Before you listen, you have thirty seconds to read questions eleven to fourteen. Hi everyone, I'm Kevin Peters, your guide today. I know it's dark and rainy, and you're probably wondering what you're doing here at 4:30 a.m. But let me assure you, it's often the most exciting experience to climb the Sydney Harbour Bridge in wild, wet weather. Our company operates 363 days a year. We have Christmas off, and about once a year, an electrical storm prevents climbing. Before I go any further, I hope you've all signed the bridge climb declaration form, which is a legal requirement. It just ensures there's no one here who shouldn't be: any woman who's more than 24 weeks pregnant, any child under 10, or anyone with broken bones. It might sound like common sense to you that these people are forbidden from climbing, but in my experience, common sense is not that common. Now. I can see a couple of you starting to shiver. Don't worry about not having enough clothing. We've got everything you'll need. Okay, gather round so you can see what's on the table in front of me. You'll get these items from the dressing room later. Clothing first: rubber-soled shoes, a jacket, a woolen hat, and an overall. We've got shoes. Jackets and overalls in every conceivable adult size, but the hats are one size fits all. You put the overall on over everything else, partly to keep warm and dry, and partly to make us feel we're a group. You'll notice the overalls grey. This way, when we climb the bridge, also painted grey, we won't distract the drivers below. The traffic's crazy enough down there. And it'll be peak hour when we reach the top of the arch. Yes, today we're going right to the top, folks. 134 meters above sea level. By the way, if there's anyone who suffers from a fear of heights, you'll be leading the group. Research has shown this is the best way to overcome your phobia. Anyhow, we'll all be attached to a static line, so falling isn't a concern. Before you listen to the rest of the talk, you have thirty seconds to read questions fifteen to twenty.
Righto, ladies and gents. The next lot of items to look at are for safety. Firstly, a headset for commentary and communication. While we're climbing, I'll be filling you in on some lesser known details about the bridge, like the fact that about six million rivets were used to put it together. Or from 1932 till 1967, it was the tallest structure in Australia. But back to your headset. This button on the left can be used if you need to speak to me. If your static line gets caught or you're in any other difficulty, please keep your headset switched on at all times. Secondly, there's a chain for your glasses. I see two of you are wearing prescription glasses. The views up on the bridge are spectacular, especially at sunrise, which we'll see. But if you want to enjoy them, keep your glasses attached with the chain. Also, our company will lose its license if anyone drops anything into the traffic. Next, a light, which attaches to the headset. Check yours is working, won't you? Because the batteries do run out. The first 20 minutes of our climb are in the dark and we've got 200 metal stairs to go up so you might need the light. There are also some narrow mesh catwalks to crawl along and some girders to squeeze past. The last safety item, and by far the most important, is the slider. As I said before, we're all clipped to a static line while we climb. That line is permanently attached to the bridge and this slider connects us to it. It's a comforting thought that we're all attached, but some of you might be thinking, doesn't that mean I won't go so far or see so much? Our climb lasts more than three hours, and this bridge is the fourth longest steel arch bridge in the world at 1.15 kilometres. Two US bridges and one in Shanghai do outdo it for length, but not for height. After sunrise, we can see the whole of Sydney Harbour and up to 80 kilometres north, south and west. One last warning. Please leave your personal items in the dressing room. You can't take your wallet or camera or even a bar of chocolate. I'll take a photo of the group at the top of the arch and send it to your email address. As I think I've already mentioned, our licence is granted on condition our customers abide by all our regulations. You're forbidden from carrying things for two reasons. One, you might drop them and cause an accident in the traffic below. And two, you need both hands free to balance or to hold on to the static line. We're going up high, remember? 134 metres above sea level. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. Water for Peace presentation. You will hear three university students discussing their presentation on an organization called Water for Peace. Before you listen, you have 30 seconds to read questions 21 to 25. So, how are we going to do this? Shall I go first, or you, Cathy? 
It might be better if I start the presentation, Beatrice, since I used to live in the Middle East. Did you? Whereabouts? In Jordan, where Water for Peace was set up. I've got quite a few photos we could use. What are they of? The ancient city of Petra, camels, and me at the Dead Sea. Hmm, I don't think they relate to our topic. I do have some from a village where women still draw their water from a well. In the countryside, this is a common phenomenon. In fact, our concept of a constant supply of clean piped water is unheard of in many parts of Jordan or Palestine. If people don't get water from a well, they might have it trucked in by large tanker which is expensive as well as inconvenient. And I've got photos off the WFP website of the director, Mr. Kusa, and a map of the region. The map shows all the towns and villages involved in this water-saving project. That sounds better. Antonio, did you find any pictures of people from Jordan, Israel and Palestine attending WFP workshops together? Unfortunately, no. In my opinion, that's what this project's about. Improving cross-border relations. I mean, where the population is so dense and where there's been such a long history of conflict, it's terrific that people are now coming together to learn from each other about ways to save water as well as ways to distribute it more equitably. I agree. I find WFP very inspiring. What's the focus of our presentation? To describe the research we've done? I think it's to analyse our research or reach a conclusion. That's how I feel as well. I mean, we can summarise all the information we've collected, but we need to synthesise it. At master's level, we're expected to be analytical. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have 30 seconds to read questions 26 to 30. What are you going to say, Cathy, in your introduction? I'll show my photos of Petra while I talk about the history of the region. Then I'll use an up-to-date regional map to show fresh water sources, rivers, lakes, aquifers, reservoirs and the like, and major concentrations of population. That'll help our audience understand the current water issues facing the three countries and lead on to Antonio's map of individual towns and villages involved in the project. Lastly, I've got some statistics from 2010 about how much water is used in agriculture, in industry and domestically. I'll cut and paste these into the photo of women getting water from the well that I mentioned earlier. Don't forget to emphasise the importance of the Jordan River, Cathy, and how WFP has saved it. Yes, that's amazing, isn't it? And all thanks to one man, really, Mr Kusa. Maybe I should follow Cathy, since my research is on WFP itself, whereas Beatrice, you're more interested in international law and the role of the United Nations, aren't you? Yes, I found all the development goals that WFP is aiming towards. According to the World Health Organization, the right to water is linked to other rights enshrined in various United Nations treaties, such as the rights to food, livelihood and housing. That may be so, but not all three countries in this project are bound by the same international law. Frankly, on paper, governments may be signatories to treaties and conventions, but on the ground, they failed in their efforts to ensure those rights or to protect the environment. 
In my country, the Philippines, we've tried to get international money and support for big government-led projects, but they are often ineffective. WFP is working from the grassroots up, which I think is preferable. What do you think, Beatrice? I'm not sure. The wider context is important. We need the UN to provide a legal framework and to set standards. Perhaps. Do you think we've got time tomorrow to practice our presentation? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. Learning styles. You will hear a lecture on a way of teaching called learning styles. Before you listen, you have 45 seconds to read questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon. Today we're going to ask the question, what helps students learn? We've all been students from an early age and we all remember teachers and schools we loved. Considerable research has been done into factors that contribute to learning and there's certainly a connection between how we feel about our teachers and how well we do in education. A teacher's own knowledge and passion for a subject is instantly communicated to his or her students, and this translates into successful learning outcomes. The teacher's personal qualities of warmth, humour, fairness and dedication are also significant. Some educators believe the rapport between the teacher and the student is the single most important factor in learning. Research has also shown that the classroom environment affects performance. Children in classes with a small number of students and those in clean, warm, spacious and pleasantly decorated classrooms score consistently higher on aptitude tests. But in the 1970s, another idea swept through education like wildfire. Millions of teachers, including me, were trained in this method. Basically, it maintained that students learn best when they use one particular learning style. The first famous learning style theory was proposed by Kolb. He divided learners into four personality types. Two of these tended towards abstract conceptualization, while the other two favored concrete experience. He claimed if teachers devised activities related to personality type, learners would be more likely to retain information. Later, Fleming developed a similar theory, which was the one taken up by education ministries around the world. His model is known as the VARC model, or the Visual, Auditory, Reading, Writing and Kinesthetic Learning Styles model. Fleming said visual learners benefit from material being presented in diagrammatic form or in photographs. Boys are often considered more visual learners than girls. Auditory learners prefer to pick up new concepts from listening either to their teacher or another source. Class discussions or debates often suit them. 
Reading writing learners do fine with the traditional methods which rely heavily on these skills. Kinesthetic or tactile learners learn faster through experience. For example, if they build models, conduct experiments, act out plays or go on excursions. Fleming believed that less than half of students benefit from reading and writing alone and that others should be taught according to their preferences for visual, sound-based or movement-based activities. Let's fast forward to the 1990s. Chris Jackson is a neuropsychologist. He's interested in changes in the brain as a result of learning. Using MRI scans, Jackson declared that Fleming's VARC model was inadequate. He concluded that four other factors influence learning. These are goal setting, diligence, concentrated reading and being emotionally intelligent. In 2007, Sia Darty supported Jackson. She added that considering what a student's achievement will be is by far the most effective way to learn. Making a child understand what he or she will be able to do makes it easier for the steps along the way to be learnt. But let's go back to Fleming's VARC model for a moment and consider it from a teaching perspective. Deciding which students are visual and which like moving around takes time. Developing specific activities is even more laborious. Furthermore, children these days need to learn rather more than children only 30 years ago. The world is a more complex and competitive place. Besides which, most exams, national and international, have little interest in the visual or kinesthetic, preferring answers that are written or spoken. Recent experiments with VARC, in ideal situations, have produced results no better than using traditional teaching methods. So, back to the question I posed at the beginning. What helps students learn? It appears the significant factors remain. The classroom environment, the teacher's personal qualities, the student's relationship with the teacher, and, above all, each student's long-term goals or belief in achievement. In my view, VARC has burdened teachers with extra preparation, pigeonholed many learners and been a diversion from the main game. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.